You may have noticed during the ordination ceremony today that the preceptor had to give instructions to the new monk. You may wonder what those instructions were. Well, the beginning instructions and the closing instructions were all pretty basic. But often it's good to go back to the basics, to remind yourself where you are, where you're going, what the whole purpose of this practice is, and how we arrive at that purpose. It helps keep things in the big picture. And these are instructions that apply not only to new monks, but also to everybody who's serious about finding true happiness. So I thought I'd recap a few of them. The instructions. The first had to do with the act of taking refuge. We take refuge in what's called the, the Triple Gem. This is related to the fact that back in the time of the Buddha they thought that gems had protective powers. In this case, though, the protective powers are the protection that comes from learning how to act in a skillful way. And you need the Triple Gem, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, first as external refuges in the sense that they give you good examples as to what to follow, what kind of behavior is really good. And then there are teachings on how you internalize the virtues of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. So they become your genuine refuge inside. Because the Buddha on the external level is you know, the individual, the Buddha. He was born more than 2,600 years ago into a very wealthy family. As he said, he had three palaces he lived in, one for the rainy season, one for the cold season, one for the dry season. Exquisite food, all kinds of pleasures. And then he realized, though, that all these pleasures were subject to aging, illness, and death. And the question was, is there something that's not subject to those things? That was the question that drove him to leave home and to find something that was ageless, free from illness, free from death. And it took him a long time to find it. But he was determined that this is what really gave meaning to life, because if you count your achievements in terms of things that can melt away, what have you got left? He wanted something that wasn't going to change. And he finally was able to do it. He found the way, attained the deathless element inside, the release of, from all suffering. They also say release from what they call the affluence. These are qualities that come bubbling up in the mind and lead you to flow along with them and create more suffering and stress. Keep coming back and back and back. He was able to end all of those things in the mind. And then he went on to teach for 45 years, set out the Dharma, set out the Vinaya, the monastic rules, in such a way that his teaching has been able to survive up to now. When you look at his life, there are three qualities that stand out. The first is his wisdom and discernment his ability to realize what needed to be done, his ability to gauge what he had learned about how to find the ultimate happiness and realizing that it was not enough and he had to go on beyond that. At the end of his period of austerities, he had the wisdom to realize, okay, there must be some other way. He was willing to abandon the pride that develops around the practice of austerities and find the middle way. That was the wisdom, the purity. Because once he had seen what had to be done, he actually did it. He looked at his thoughts and words and deeds and kept bringing them into line with the things he had learned by examining them, realizing what was skillful, what was not, abandoning what was unskillful, developing what was skillful, regardless of whether there were things that he liked or not. He was able to look at the long term, the long term results of his actions and bring his actions into line with what he had learned from observing what he had been doing and saying and thinking. And then there's his compassion, the fact that he taught for 45 years, going all over northern India, 
every day teaching the people who were, were ready to learn the Dharma, even up to the day he was dying. There was one more person he had to teach, and he walked for several hours even after having a bad case of dysentery, and taught that one last person. So these are the qualities that we see in the Buddha's life, and these are the qualities we want to internalize. Develop his wisdom both about the means to true happiness and what it actually means to find true happiness, to purify our actions in line with what we've learned, and then to be compassionate. I mean, this is not the last of the, the virtues. Because the fact that we want to find a true happiness that's harmless means that we're showing compassion for ourselves and compassion for other people. Now how we do that is taught through the Dharma. Now again, the Dharma has an external and an internal dimension. External Dharma is the Dharma you read, the Dharma you hear, the Dharma that's been written down, that people have memorized for generations and generations. That's called the Dharma of study, the Pradyati Dhamma. And then you take those teachings and you put them into practice. This is how you take your external refuge and begin to internalize it to the Eightfold Noble Path, which we divide into three main sections. There's virtue, and concentration, and discernment. That's called Bhati-Bhati Dharma, the Dharma of the practice. And then finally there's Bhati Weta Dhamma, which is the Dharma of attainment, when you actually attain that release within yourself. That's when it's fully internalized and your refuge is really secure. Now the third refuge, the Sangha, again exists on an external and an internal level. The external level has two types. They're the members of the monastic order. That's called the conventional Sangha. And they're a refuge in the sense that they've been able to maintain the customs and the teachings for over 2,600 years now, keeping this alive. So it's not just old, musty books in a dead language. But as you may have noticed, part of the ceremony today was when the person requesting ordination requests dependence. The word dependence, nisaya in Pali, has turned into nisai in Thai, which means habits. In other words, he wants to learn the habits of being a good monk, not just the words, but also what is it like to embody these things. And the conventional Sangha has been able to keep a lot of that alive, but not as well as the second level of Sangha, which is the noble Sangha. These are people, whether ordained or not, who have actually, at the very least, attained the first level of awakening. They're even more reliable guides to what the Buddha was talking about, because they've seen within their own hearts and minds that what the Buddha said was true. There really is a deathless dimension that can be found through the practice. But the fact that they say that still doesn't prove anything. You have to internalize it through the practice until you, too, attain the levels of what they call stream entry, once returning, non-returning, arahantship, four levels of awakening having a direct experience of the deathless, realizing that this dimension really is there. The Buddha knew what he was talking about. And then you become a member of the Noble Sangha yourself, and then you become a refuge for others. So that was the first teaching in the beginning of the ceremony. And at the end, it goes back to that central part of the act of taking refuge, i.e., the practice. And this is related to what are called the Four Noble Dhammas. It starts out first with virtue, concentration, discernment. And as the passage that I chanted said, it's when your concentration is nurtured through virtue or is fostered through virtue that has great fruit. Now some people misinterpret this, thinking that if you don't have any virtue at, or your virtue isn't pure yet, you can't do concentration, or if your concentration isn't pure, you can't develop discernment. That's not the case. But it's when you have concentration and it's also nurtured by virtue, it's going to bear great fruit. Now it is possible to attain concentration and to have pretty sloppy virtue, but it's not going to go very far. 
because there's a lot of misunderstanding around this. I've known some people whose concentration is strong and their virtue is pretty, pretty lousy. And they've decided, well, it must not matter, because here the concentration is strong and you can't have concentration without virtue, as they thought. But what that does, it develops dishonesty. The mind starts lying to itself, thinking that it's not being damaged, and it really impairs your ability to develop discernment, which is the fruit of concentration. Same with discernment. You can have some discernment without strong concentration. You can read the books and you can apply the teachings to your life and gain some benefit from it. But it's all very limited. Because there's a lot of there are many levels in the mind that you're not going to detect. And many levels again of self deception you're not going to detect unless you get really, really strong stillness based on the, the honesty of virtue. And that's when you can see things clearly. That's just why the Buddha said, concentration is nurtured by virtue, it has great fruit. When discernment is nurtured by concentration, it has great fruit. And then when the mind is nurtured through discernment, it gains release from the, from the, the affluence, becoming sensuality and ignorance. If you don't know anything about Buddhist doctrine, you know that those three effluents are the things that have to be abandoned after the first glimpse of awakening. So it's seeing the Four Noble Truths around suffering and stress. That's basically the way to the first level of awakening, and then learning how to see what are these effluents becoming as basically your sense of identity in a world of experience, which can either be here in this human world or in the worlds of the mind. You see this clearly when you drift off to sleep, and if you're, if you're observant, you notice that so there's, there's a picture that may appear in the mind, and all of a sudden you find yourself in the picture. It's like going into a TV set. And then you inhabit that world for a while, and then it dissipates, or it disappears, or it just moves into another one. Then you go from one level of becoming to another, to another, to another. And there's always stress involved with that. That's one of the effluents. Another one is sensuality, the, the fascination we have with thinking about sensual pleasures. The pleasures themselves are not a problem. It's our fascination with just thinking about them over and over and over again. How you want this, how you want that, what you're going to do to get this, what you're going to do to get that. You can think about that for a long time. And it ties the mind down. As the Buddha said, these are fetters. Then finally there's ignorance, which in this case means not having fully completed the duties with regard to the noble truths. In other words, you haven't fully comprehended stress, you haven't fully abandoned the cause. You haven't fully realized the cessation of stress and suffering, and you haven't fully developed a path to the end. But when you go beyond these things, the sensuality becoming ignorance, that's when the awakening is full. And that's when the mind is released. And there's a release on many levels. There's release from stress and suffering. There's release from anything inside the mind that would churn up more stuff in the future. At that point, you're even released from the dimensions of space and time, it's something totally other. Totally unconditioned. And so then the instructions end by reminding the new monk one to work on develop work on developing what's called heightened virtue, heightened mind, and heightened discernment. In other words, go back to those three parts of the path and bring them to a heightened level. For most of us, virtue, concentration, and discernment are things that come to some extent and then we lose them, or we have them in some areas but not in other areas. To heighten them means that you develop them all the time. They're all around. And then it's with the, the Buddha's last words, which were to attain consummation by being heedful. Heedful is, heedfulness is the quality that realizes that your actions make a big difference as to whether you're going to be suffering or whether you're going to experience happiness. 
So you have to be very careful about what you do. As for the consummation, you bring all the factors of the path to consummation. And then they deliver you to some things even beyond them. Because after all, they are conditions, they are fabrications, they are things you do and intend to do. But they can take you to something that's beyond them. It's like the road going to the Grand Canyon, or the act of going to the Grand Canyon. The act of going to the Grand Canyon doesn't cause the Grand Canyon to be, but it gets you there. This is why the Buddha called this a path. And at that point, your refuge is really secure. You find something totally free from the conditions of space and time. something that once you've attained, you will never lose. <laughs>